the first book of Samuel, session 57. And we learned in the previous sessions that David was persecuted for no real reason. Yet he loved his enemy, although it was so difficult. And how Yahuwah allowed Saul, his enemy, a typical or a typology of the beast to rule, but only for a time, only for a period, especially to make his bride go through the wilderness of Ziph and the wilderness of Ma'on. And we don't interfere in God's timeline. We see all through the examples of the first Exodus, how when Moses thought he was the savior of Israel and he killed an Egyptian with his own hand, it wasn't yet the time. It wasn't God's timing because God's 430 years since he gave covenant to Abraham was prophesied and that had to run its course for many reasons. First of all, if it's written, it has to be done because the time of the Ammonites and the Canaanites must be completed. All the evil of the land of Canaan had to come to its fullest before God sent Israel to go and uh, cleanse the land. But also to get Moses ready. Because when Moses thought he was now ready to save Israel and he killed the Egyptian, he wasn't near ready yet. Forty years later, after he learned to be a shepherd, and he saved Israel with a shepherd's staff and not with, his, not with his sword, after he learned to be the most humble man on earth, that's when God could use him. So the same journey goes for David and for all God's beloved, who is a topology of David. So chapter 25 is now the death of Samuel. Now 1 and 2 Samuel has been written even after Samuel's death. So the rest of the, the books of Samuel is all about the history of Saul. The rest of the, the books of Samuel is all about the history of Saul, David and Jonathan and later on Solomon and the kings and, and everything that happened with Israel. It's still named by the name of the prophet Samuel. Shema Al, listen to Yahuwah. Shema to Elohim. Because the rest of these ancient writings is so that Israel for the rest of time can Shema to their Elohim. Although the actual prophet Samuel is now dead. So Samuel died, verse 1 of chapter 25. And all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And this is the end of Samuel. Now we, we don't hear about Samuel again until Saul calls up the demon, the familiar spirit of Samuel. Not Samuel himself, of course. We'll get to that. So David of the wilderness of Paran. So David's heart must have been broken. He loved the prophet Samuel. And Samuel loved David. And there could have been so much written about Samuel's death. Why did he die? I think it was purely old age. Um, Samuel definitely wasn't sick. He just died when his time was over and his body gave in because of age. And yet after everything that this amazing prophet has done, we only have one verse, chapter 25, verse 1, that says he died and they buried him. And that's it. Here's the end of your life. No matter... What amazing things you do, no matter how hard you work, how much you've prayed for Israel, how much suffering you had. When you die, you die. And all that really remembers you is your name that's written in the book of life. And when Yahuwah raises you up, he's the only one that really knows you and that really knows you and loves you. And he knew Samuel and he loved Samuel. And Samuel is going to be resurrected in the last day by Yeshua Messiah. And Samuel is going to get his reward that was coming to him. There wasn't a big hoo-ha made about his, his life and his burial in the scriptures. But there will be a big hoo-ha and a big hooray for Samuel on the day of resurrection. And on, on the day of our rewards given to us. So, verse 2, there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of this man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman 
And this is important now because now chapter 25 is again about the wise and foolish good understanding. But her man was churlish and evil in his doing, and he was of the house of Caleb. So in the King James, the word for this man of hers, Nabal, who was churlish, that word churlish has the meaning of cruel and hard, obstinate, obstinate, rough, sore and stubborn, and a man of trouble, and very stiff-necked. Churlish is translated from kashe, kashe. He was a kashe man, stiff, naked, cruel, and obstinate. But Abigail, up Abigail, her name has the meaning of my father is joy. Abigail, Abba Gail, my father is joy. And she was a wise woman. She had good understanding and she was beautiful. What a combination, woman. She had good understanding and she was beautiful. What a combination. Many beautiful women are utter fools. Um, and just focused on their beauty. And many women that are wise and of good understanding are sometimes, you know, not so beautiful. And that's why, you know, they're not invited to all the parties and they are not so popular. So they tend to turn to Yahuwah and, and fall in love with him and, and follow his ways. But here we have a beautiful bride that has good understanding as well. We have this wise and foolish contradiction between Nabal and Abigail. Nabal is a fool and Abigail is wise. And we also have this dichotomy between the bride and the wrong husband. Adam and Eve chose the wrong voice to listen to, the wrong fruit to eat, and got the wrong, and got the wrong seed inside of them. Satan has stolen God's wife. So has he done with Israel, and that's why God divorced her as well. So this bride, now that she, she's becoming, Abigail is a, is a typology of the bride. She, she is a woman of good understanding. And we'll go through, when, when we read the rest of the chapter, we'll see how her wisdom is so much more deeper than just cleverness. She knows who David is. The bride knows who Yeshua is. And this woman who has come out of paganism, idolatry and foolishness, she has good understanding and she's beautiful. She's beautiful to her husband. We are be not Nabal. Nabal is cruel and he he, he's just probably bragging about his beautiful wife, but he's not treating her um, right. He's cruel towards her. But we are beautiful in the eyes of our Messiah. So we as, as the Abigail typology, as, as the Abigail typology has good understanding, we've come through this whole process of learning the truth and that um, spending time in the tabernacle gives us the wisdom and the understanding under the light of the sevenfold menorah. So here we have Nabal, the, the cruel man, foolish man, antichrist, enemy, Satan typology in dichotomy to the beautiful, good understanding and wise Abigail, my father is my joy. And just like the woman at the well, Yeshua came and he said, you were married five times and the sixth man you're living for is not even your husband. As we went through that Genesis um, session 20, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I think we got to L. There were so many sessions of the woman at the well and how the the, the bride, the, the, the people of God, is hopping from husband to husband. Six, the number of the beast is 666. Husband number six is not even her true husband. It's not the right husband. It's the Antichrist system with whom you're living in sin. Like Abigail is living with a fool for a husband, Nabal. And isn't it amazing that in the Hebrew language, the word for Nabal has the meaning of Stupid, wicked, impious, vile, foolish. So as we read about who and who Nabal is and what he did, we can assume and we can um, conclude that he was a cruel, um, stupid, wicked, foolish man. And now we're going to the Hebrew and that's exactly what his name means as well.
So David um, heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the ten, ten young men. And David said unto the ten young men, Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Wow. As we go through, you must bring all this together. So David as a typology of Messiah. Messiah Yeshua looks after all sheep. We'll see now how David has been looking after Nabal's sheep. As David, well, what was that town's name? Do you remember? Kayla in chapter 23. David, as he was um, uh, fleeing from Saul, wherever David came and there was um, some of his brothers in need or there was danger towards anybody in the tri uh, tribes of Israel, David and his men would actually help and they would stand in and they will fight. So David was, was wherever he went, he would look after the sheep of his neighboring um, fellow Israelites, just like Messiah. And Messiah, as the, the bride becomes wise, as the ten lost tribes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who scattered into all the nations, as we remember the Torah and we start reading Messiah, the word of God that became flesh, and we start spending time under the menorah light, and we, we, we get the good understanding and we become more beautiful for Yahuwah. That is how we then grow into the beautiful bride in the ten lost tribes. So Judah is still busy with their blindness and God has a specific period for them. We cannot interfere. We can pray for them and we can try to, uh, to testify to them. But we are in the ten lost tribes. We are scattered into every tribe, nation and tongue. We are being gathered by David, the beloved shepherd that became king, absolutely messianic picture. Shepherd, he's the good shepherd. He becomes king, absolutely messianic picture. Shepherd, he's the good shepherd. He becomes king. Yeshua is the anointed king. Samuel anointed David. Shema El, <clears throat> God listens when we cry to him and he anointed Moshiach, um, Yeshua, to become um, the king but this king is a shepherd just like David the king is a shepherd so we learn about um, this mess messianic mysteries and about God's kingdom and we become wise and we are the ten men like the ten men will grab onto the tzitzit of a Jew and say take us with you we know God is with you there's the ten virgins there was the ten camels that Rebecca had to give water to and we can continue with it with the ten lepers there are so many examples of ten all through scriptures that is um prophetically pointing towards the ten tribes so david is and he sends the ten men to nabal to the foolish world to say david the shepherd who is anointed king who is this great warrior he's got a message for you so the ten men goes up and the ten men has to greet Nabal in the name of David. Just like we, in the name of Yeshua, we go out and we greet, um, well, we don't greet Satan, but we greet the world that is ruled by Satan in the name of Yeshua. And thus shall you say to him that lives in prosperity, Peace be unto both you, and peace be to your house, and peace be unto all that you have. And now I have heard that you have sharing now, your shepherds, which were here with us, we didn't hurt them. Neither was there anything missing unto them, all the while that they were in Carmel. All right. So remember now, I went to Paran. Now, this is in the wilderness of the Carmel area. So while they were there, the shepherds of Nabal came um, with their sheep. Because remember in those days, the shepherds had to take the sheep wherever they can find grass and water. So they, they were forever um, wandering around um, looking for new pastures, green pastures for the sheep. So as Nabal's shepherds brought the sheep close to where David was, David didn't steal any of the sheep. David didn't hurt any of the shepherds or force them 
to give them sheep so that they can have something to eat. Remember, David's in the wilderness. They don't have food with him all the time. They are, you know, living in caves, living under trees, living, sleeping under the stars. But David didn't ever hurt any of the shepherds of Nabal. In fact, he didn't even take one sheep. And in fact, he didn't even take one sheep. And he tells his ten men to speak this witness towards the foolish Nabal, the cruel Nabal. And um, you can ask your own young men, ask them, and they will tell you. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in your eyes, for we come in a good day. We come in a day where your prosperity, as you are shearing your sheep, and you can see how big your um, cattle, um, um, what is it, your, your flock is, um, in this good day, wherein you have all your sheep, because we looked after your sheep, we protected your shepherds when they were living close to us. And because of us, you've got this big flock. So in this good day, where none of your sheep is missing, we looked after them with your own men. Ask your men. We were good to them. Right? We come in this good day of yours and we ask you, please, you know, a little bit we've done towards you. That whatever comes to your hand, unto your servants and unto David, give that to us. So David is sending the 10 men to go and ask for um, a little bit of food. You know, maybe give us one sheep and, you know, a few breads and maybe some of your, of your fruits in your trees because you are prosperous and you are an Israelite. You are from the house of um, Caleb. You live under the Torah and the Torah says you must share your prosperity. You mustn't have an evil eye. An evil eye means you are greedy and selfish. You must look after those who ask you of something, and especially for David. Not only because you know David, David has been fighting for Israel all these years, but also because David was fighting for your shepherds. Come on, this is just, it's due to us. You you need to repay us a little bit. But we haven't demanded pay ever. We've taken sheep if we wanted to. We are 600 men. We can totally, you know, ransack your your house. Um, But that's not the kind of people we are. We are your brothers. And we have looked after your your flocks. So we are coming to ask you nicely to please give us something. We are not demanding. And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David. And then they stopped speaking. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who the hell is David? I don't care about David. Who's the son of Jesse? So it's not like Nabal didn't know David. All the country knew David. Everybody knew David, the man who killed Goliath. Everybody knew he also. Nabal knew that David was the son of Jesse. Everybody knew at this stage that Samuel has anointed David, the son of Jesse, to be king. Everybody knew that. So it wasn't like, who is David? He said, who does this man think he is? The son of Jesse. Does he think he's anybody? There be many servants nowadays that breaks away from a man, every man from his master. So Nabal is saying that there's many people running around in the wilderness that are just poor servants that left the houses of their masters, as if David was a servant to Saul. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my sheep shearers and give it to you, whom I know not where you are or where you come from? Wow. So just like all foolish, nabal, wicked, serpent kind of people, they are only for themselves. They don't, well, they claim to believe in the God of the Bible. You've got millions of people out there who believe in God and who claim they follow God's will and God's ways, but they only live for themselves. They will not stick out their necks like David did for all of Israel, even for Kayla, even when Kayla delivered David into Saul's hand. Um, there's many people like Nabal. Most people are like Nabal. They will not stick out their neck for somebody like David who deserves a bit of kindness. 
And even if David did nothing for Nabal's shepherds, or even if David did nothing for Israel before, or even if David's name wasn't known in all of Israel, you know, he was a man that is hungry. And the Torah teaches us to feed the hungry. So Nabal was a total fool because he never mind what he was see never mind what he was doing to to david he wasn't obeying yahuwah's commandments he was a fool and this is the definition of the foolish virgins the the word fool all through scripture is always used for people who deny the word or the torah of yahuwah who doesn't keep the torah this wisdom and understanding in keeping the torah and we're going to see that's why um, they say in verse 3 that Abigail was a woman of good understanding. She was Torah obedient. She was, we'll see now that she looked after her whole household. She, she looked beautifully after her slaves and her servants. And she helped strangers that were hungry and that came to them for help. That's the kind of woman that the ten lost um, tribes become when they turn back to Yahuwah. This is the kind of bride that God needs for the end days. A bride that will run after the ten men and that will do well towards David, the beloved anointed king, because she has the Torah as her foundation. Not like her foolish husband, not like this foolish world we live in now that that has an evil eye towards other people, especially towards the anointed King Yeshua. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told David all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye every man his sword. And they girded on every side their swords. And they went after David about 400 men and 200 abode by their stuff. All right, so there's still 600 men. 400 is going back to Nabal's farm. Ooh, Nabal, you've got trouble coming your way, my pal. And 200 stays behind to look after the little cave or, you know, wherever they were living. So, so see what's happening here. This Nabal world that is evil and wicked and cruel and doesn't live according to the Torah, that, that is a fool to listen to the serpent in the tree of knowledge with all his false promises and who gets married to the serpent. Um, there's only two religions. There is the, there is the relationship with, with the God of creation who says you eat only from the tree of life and all the other trees that I give you. There's only that husband. And then all other religions, even if it's religions that seems to say they worship the God of the Bible, if they don't follow the way of the instructions that this God gave, because this God is different than all the other religions and all the other gods. Um, and this God says, here is my way. But then the rest of the religions and this, here is my way. But then the rest of the religions and the faiths and the beliefs and the traditions and the cultures and all of humanity is gathered under the tree of knowledge of good and evil, although they think they might even be worshipping Yahuwah, they are still eating the son of lawlessness, the lawless one, the antichrist fruit, and they're married to him. So this world that's married to Nabal, and that Nabal is, is um, um, typifying the foolishness of this world, that is rejecting the wisdom of God's Torah. If we don't become like Abigail, to come out of Nabal's house, and follow David and do good to David's ten men, the ten lost tribes. Then David will come, Yeshua will come with his sword. The Bible says he comes out of heaven with his host, his heavenly host, all his angels. And he'll come to the soul, the house of the wicked, cruel, foolish one. This world that is ruled by Satan and all the people that are married to Satan. He will come back and destroy you. And even Abigail will be destroyed unless Abigail comes out of Babylon, my people, and do good towards the ten tribes and follow the beloved one. So verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, and said, Behold, David has sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. 
and our master sent them away empty-handed. But these men were very good unto us, and we were never hurt when we were in the wilderness of Carmel. Neither did we miss anything. They didn't take one sheep from us. As long as we were conversant with them, as long as we were in conversation with them, as long as we were present with them, as long as we were in conversation with them, as long as we were around them, close to them, we were never hurt and nothing was ever missed. N no a robber or hyena or wolf or Philistine ever wanted to attack us and take our sheep because of David and his men. As long as we were in the fields, we were looked after by David and his men. So the servants of Abigail goes to her. They don't dare speak to Nabal because they don't want to lose their heads or get a, a whipping or a lashing. They go to the wise woman, not to the foolish man, to try and plead the case for, for David. And these good servants of Abigail reminds me of the good servants that we are told to be. If we look at Daniel 11, you know, the end time journey will be really hard and there will be many times, even in our journey today, like Messiah says in the New Testament, don't be like the Pharisees who want to make a big show every time they do good. When they fast, everybody must know they're fasting. When they give out charity, everybody must see how charitable they are. David was looking after the men in the wilderness just because they were in the wilderness, because he had a good heart. He didn't do it for reward. He did it because it was, first of all, what his father wanted. It's in the Torah. Secondly, this is the human thing to do. When there are people living next to you and they're in trouble, then you protect them, you help them. This is the kind of man David was. And sometimes we do good things. We do good deeds to our neighbors or we, we even do good deeds on our knees when we spend time in prayer for our neighbors. And nobody ever sees that. And sometimes this world will repay you evil for good. And sometimes this world will repay you evil for good, like we saw yesterday. Our soul repaid um, David's good with only evil. This world will never recognize you. This world will never thank you or give you the reward or the recognition for all the hard work that you've put in. Whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional or um, doesn't matter what it is that you do that's not being recognized. It is written in the books of life. And here the servants are revealing the good works of David. So everything that David has done, we see that he says in, um, in verse 21, David says, In vain have I kept all that this fellow had in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all his um, animals or his servants, because he has returned me evil for good. Just like Saul, all the good things that has done for Israel, fighting Goliath and fighting against the Philistines, all that good was repaid by Saul with evil. All the good that David did for Nabal's shepherds in the wilderness was repaid with evil. And so all the good that we try to do for Israel, for God's kingdom, that we do, try to do for shepherds, for people leading um, flocks, and for the sheep in the wilderness, in our wilderness journey, while we are hungry, we are running away, we are fighting for our own lives, we are still finding the love that the Torah speaks about to fight for our neighbors as well. And although the world does not recognize this, although Nabal does not even care about this. Who the hell do you think you are? You are nothing to me, he says to, to David's men. Although this foolish, satanic, evil, cruel world does not value the work we put in, value the work we put in into God's sheepfold or into the world. As we, um, we learned in the previous sessions, we love our enemy. We don't take the sword in our own hand when it's not the time of Yahuwah yet. Although it's difficult and we are in a wilderness running away, um, spiritually even, from the wicked ones, we um, find grace and mercy 
in the cave where Saul came to have a little bit of a stink. So it's, it's amazing how God's character must be built into not only David, the beloved, but Abigail, the bride, and the servants of Abigail, the good and faithful servants of Yahuwah, that reveals the good works of David to Abigail. Like the books will be opened. The Bible says the angels, God's serv servants, will open the books and we will be rewarded or punished according to our works. So David, know all the work you did in the wilderness has not been in vain. Like he says in verse 21, it's not in vain. You have done good things. See now, Abigail has heard about this. The bride has heard about the beautiful things Yeshua has done in the wilderness for the lost sheep. And we come to Yeshua with wine and food and, and, and uh, um, sheep, uh, flesh, meat and, and uh, grapes and figs and all beautiful things. We come with an offering. Yeshua, our beloved anointed king, we know all the things you did in secret. I know it's written in the Bible, but <clears throat> we had to spend time in the wilderness of Maon under the slave master Nabal or in Egypt. And we had to really follow Moses and learn about Moses. Start keeping the Shabbat. Start reading your Torah. Start seeing the beautiful mysteries and prophecies of everything you have done for us. Nobody else wants to recognize it, but we recognize it. This, this we'll have a look at in the next session when Abigail and David finally meets. When this woman that has good understanding and wisdom follows after the ten men, looks after David's men and comes and falls down before David with a sacrifice in her hand, with gifts and offerings. And eventually, and I don't want to spoil the grand finale, but this is the kind of bride that Yeshua wants. Because David ends up marrying Abigail. This is the heavenly courting betrothing, betrothal system. Sending out the ten men to go and speak to the foolish Nabal. And the good servants, Yer and Shema Al. And with Abigail, we come out to our master in the wilderness. When they say, he's here, or the Christ has come, he's there, don't go. But, but know where your Messiah is and follow him wherever he goes, even if that means out of your comfort in Egypt, through the wilderness, because we don't interfere in his timeline. Even the journey in the wilderness was necessary. The 40 years Moses needed to be prepared was the 40 years Israel needed in the wilderness to be prepared as well. And David, we will see, ended up ruling Israel for 40 years. Just like, remember when we did the book of Judges, Gideon and Samson and Gideon and Samson and how many of these people um, in the book of Judges uh, were ruling for 40 years. No, not Samson, but, um, you know, many of those judges, I can't remember exactly all of them, but for so many times through the book of Judges, we'll see that this Messianic period of 40 was so beautiful. So this bride, Abigail, father is my joy, knows the difference between David, the beloved, the anointed king, and Nabal, the cruel husband. And she chooses David at the end of the day. Without permission from her husband, she, does, uh, she goes and does the good, wise thing. And that saves her life. Because David was on his way to go and destroy Nabal's house. He ended up not destroying Nabal's house. So you know what? Yahuwah then stepped in. But at that stage, Abigail was safe. All right, we'll, we'll continue with this amazing, beautiful marriage between God and his people. Um, we'll, we'll continue with the story tomorrow when we see how Abigail